welcome back to the revision class for UGC NET English for the upcoming exam. And this class is provided by Professor Academy Chennai. In today's class, we are going to look at poetry, groups, and movements. Let's start with Scottish Chaucerians. When we think of groups and movements in poetry, we are not talking about groups and movements in drama or novel because there are also other schools, uh, groups and movements in other genres. For instance, university wits under drama. But today we are going to concentrate only on groups and movements related to poetry. And in English literature, when we think of groups and movements, we can think of first Scottish Chaucerians. Poets who, are, or who were inspired by Chaucer's writing. They were Robert Henderson, William Dunbar, Gavin Douglas, David Lindsay, King James one of Scotland, Harry the Minstrel. So these poets were called, or they called themselves Scottish Chaucerians because they imitated the writing style of Geoffrey Chaucer of England. And that's why they called themselves Scottish Chaucerians. They were Scotland, uh, they belonged to Scotland. They were also called Macaris, M-A-K-A-R-I-S. Macaris means poets. In yesterday's clause on literary criticism, we discussed Philip Sidney's An Apology for Poetry. In it, Sidney says, the Greeks use the word poem, P-O-I-E-I-N. The word poem means to make, and from that, we got the word poet. Poet means to makers. In the same way, Macarians means makers or poets. And one of the important poets or Scottish Chaucerians is King James one of Scotland. And here's a famous work by James one of Scotland. The King's Quair, Q-U-A-I-R, or in translation, the King's Book, which is a significant work when we discuss Scottish Chaucerians. And how to remember a group or a movement? You have to think of a concept or a poem by one of the famous writers. So in order to remember Scottish Chaucerians, think of the King, and his contribution to literary stanzas, like Chaucerian stanza. So Chaucerian stanza was by Chaucer. Chaucer came up with a seven line decosyllabic stanza. This is Chaucerian stanza named after Geoffrey Chaucer, but this was imitated by King One of Scotland in his book, The King's Book. And because of his association with this stanza, it is called Rhyme Royal because of his royalty. Chaucerian stanza now is also called Rhyme Royal because it is associated with King One of Scotland. And Chaucer used this stanza for the first time in his work, Complaint Unto Pity. You can get questions like the, how many lines are there in Chaucerian stanza, or uh, you can get questions like Chaucer in stanza is also called Rhyme Royal. And you should also remember the rhyme scheme. A look at the end words of every line. So you have the last word, ago, A-G-O-O, -O, at the end of the first line. Then the next word, pain, P-E-Y-N-E. -E. So when you mark rhyme scheme, the first word, you go with A, letter A. Then if it doesn't rhyme with the next word, then you go for B. So then look at the third word, O, W O O. It rhymes with the first one, A G O O. So we mark it as A. Then we go for fain, F E Y N E, which rhymes with pain, P E Y N E. So we mark it B. Then complain, it should be B. And the last two, they differ from the above. T I R A N N Y E. Chiranai. Or next word, die, D Y E. So they rhyme. So we go for C, C. So this is the rhyme scheme A, B, A, B, B, C, C. So sometimes they might ask, what is the rhyme scheme of Chaucerian stanza or rhyme royal? So this is the 
crime scheme a b a b b c c okay so here after when we think of scottish chaucerian think of chaucerian stanza rhyme royal then all the poets and this rhyme scheme okay let's go for the next one of course metaphysical poets a very famous school of poetry in the uh, in the elizabethan age and before that so we have john dun and his followers dryden was the one who called dun <coughs> affects the metaphysics dun affects the metaphysics because of dryden's phrase we get the name metaphysical school of poetry or metaphysical poets what do you mean by metaphysics when we say metaphysics some meta means beyond you go beyond the physical beyond the body so you try to reach the soul the spiritual so in their poetry in metaphysical poets poems you can see they try to combine the physical and the spiritual the body and the mind the feeling and the thought that's why they are called metaphysics they affect the metaphysics and these are the metaphysical poets we have abraham cowley john cleveland andrew marvel george herbert henry wohan richard crashaw thomas trehern what you have to do now find at least a poem written by each of these poets so that you can remember each of them and you also have a question here in which work did dryden say dun affects the metaphysics so let me know the answer in the comment box dryden name the work by dryden in which he says dun affects the metaphysics a clue the work starts with the word discourse then there are two more words discourse dash and dash so let me know the answer next one so when we think of metaphysical poets they are known for using metaphysical conceit conceit means comparison but not just an ordinary comparison a kind of a far fetched comparison but they go they go well together all right for instance we have john dunn's a valediction forbidding morning in which he compares a pair of lovers with twin legs of a compass so it's a far fetched comparison but the comparison is a striking a striking one so this kind of striking comparisons are bringing feelings and thought together is called metaphysical conceit a kind of a comparison a metaphor right and dr johnson in his work life of cowley said metaphysical conceit you know in which there are two you know you, you make comparisons it's like heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together he said this in a derogatory tone it's not a compliment he is not praising the comparison or metaphysical poets uh, way of bringing two two uh, far fetched things together he is attacking them so he said heterogeneous ideas because they are not homogeneous because in a metaphor or a simile you have to uh, bring two dissimilar things together so yoke you bring together but by violence it's not natural the comparison is not a natural comparison it's by violence together so here is another example from john dunn's work this time from his uh, poem from holy sonnets because uh, he is known for his works uh, or called holy sonnets find out how many sonnets are there in holy sonnets by john dunn one of the works batter my heart three percent god referring to uh, the father the son and the holy spirit christian uh, theology here so i like an usurped town to another dew labor to admit you but oh to no end reason you are viceroy in me me should defend but is cap captived and proves weak or untrue so here dun comes up with a beautiful comparison he says a human soul or my soul i is like a town what you have to do as a god you are a uh, you are someone who has to conquer this town 
so the town will not yield to you you have to conquer this town so the soul is like an usurped town a town that defends itself god is someone is like is, god is like a conqueror who has to besiege lay besiege to siege to this town and conquer this town and this kind of a, con a comparison is very rare so it's kind of a military metaphor or kind of a war metaphor and this is a beautiful metaphysical conceit comparing soul to a town and god to a conqueror or even enemy so this is very far fetched comparison but it provokes thoughts so that's the important thing about a uh, metaphysical concept it's also called bit w i t because which which makes us think and also feel okay with this let's go to cavalier poets when we say cavalier poets we have four one richard lovelace john suckling thomas caro and robert herring why they are called cavalier poets cavalier poets refer to the supporters of king charles 1 during the civil war in england so the 1600s especially 1640s so 1640s the king lost his power almost his power uh, we had commonwealth coming in and charles 1 was beheaded in 1649 and that comes uh, or that came commonwealth period we have oliver cromwell and his brother and the puritan age uh, let me know uh, because before the start of the puritan age or commonwealth period theaters were closed in england because people thought uh, i mean puritans thought theater were uh, corrupters of the soul so in which year theaters were closed in england so let me know the answer in the comment section okay so these supporters cavaliers were against round heads round heads were the supporters of the parliament so they clashed with one another on the one hand we have cavalier poets the supporters of the king on the other hand we have round heads the supporters of the parliament they clashed with uh, each other but anyway uh, we are more concerned about the poets so we have richard lovelace so these poet uh, poets called themselves sons of ben sons of ben johnson they followed the style writing style of ben johnson and some of their writing uh, some of the poets uh, they look similar to metaphysical poets because uh, they also talk about the soul and sensuality so here is a poem by robert herrick Koreanas going a maying. Uh, this poem is a poem of uh, a poem has this motive called Carpe Diem, C O R P E D M D I E M. Carpe Diem poem. It's a motive. A motive is something that comes again and again. A theme that comes again and again. When we say Carpe Diem, that means to seize the day, to make use of the day, to make use of the youth. Do not squander away your youth. Make use of. more to do with lovers they don't want to waste time they want to enjoy their life both physically and spiritually so that is the theme that runs both in metaphysical uh, school of poetry and in the works of cavalier poets and this poem is an example of a uh, carpe diem poem koreanas going a maying maying here refers to may day a festival a spring time festival may day okay Uh, so let's read the lines get up get up for shame the blooming moth upon her wings presents the gold unshorn so it's morning the sun is inviting you to enjoy the day but what are you doing so the lover is asking the lady love to wake up and enjoy the day then while time serves so this is the key word a key phrase here while the time serves so there is always a concern about the time which is a fleeing which is very short so make use of the time seize that day and we are but decaying come my koreana come let's go a may so here is a person who invites his lady love to enjoy the day so let's go to may day or let's go to bed let's enjoy this time with each other 
Okay, so that is implied here. And we have poems like this, a kind of bringing the sensual and the spiritual together. Uh, poems like John Dunn's The Flea, F-L-E-A. Flea, where this insect flea bites the lover and the lady love. And a kind of uh, metaphysical concept, uh, the speaker says, or the, uh, the lover says, okay, this insect has bitten you and me. It has the blood of you as well as me. In a way, we are mingled in marriage. And this flea is like the church. It's a holy thing, but it's not just a holy. It's also uh, physical, all right? So bringing the spiritual and the sensuous together. So that's also a very famous poem by Andrew Marvel to his dash. Very famous poem in which we get the same theme. So let me know the poem by Andrew Marvel in the comment section. Okay, let's go to the Scribblerus Club. S-C-R-I-B-L-E-R-U-S. The Scribblerus Club. The word Scribblerus is actually, uh, it's not a real name, a fictional one. So these writers, Jonathan Swift, Alexander Pope, John Gay, John Albert North, Thomas Parnell, they created a fictional character, a literary quack, a fake writer called Martinus Scribblerus. Why did they do that? Because they want to, um, no, they want to mock people who uh, pretend to be scholarly, who pretend to be poets, and they want to make fun of them. So they created this fictional literary quack, fake writer. And this is the logic, scribbler, S-C-R-I-B-L-E-R, -E refers to, at that time, it refers to uh, a talentless writer, a writer who has, who is just shallow, who has nothing at all, just using bombastic words and jargon to impress people in his writing or her writing. And they created this club, the Scribblerus Club. And their main aim to ridicule the false taste in learning, how these fake writers, you know, cheat people with their jargon and technical terms. And let's look at a work uh, by Pope. Epistle to Sir Albert Knott. Pope is known for his harsh criticism. That's why he has a nickname called the WASP, W-A-S-P of a dash. Uh, let me know the answer in the comment section. Uh, fill it out. What is the nickname of, a uh, nickname given to Alexander Pope for his harsh criticism. The Wasp of Dash it refers to the name of the place, his, uh, the, where he lived. Wasp of, it starts with the letter T. Wasp of Dash. Wasp, insect which bites, B, right? If it bites, it hurts. So that's why uh, he's called the Wasp of that place. Okay. So in this work, Epistle to Dr. Albert Knott, he ridicule Dr. Uh, sorry, Joseph Addison and John Hervey. In this work, he called Joseph Addison Atticus, and this is how he ridiculed uh, Joseph Addison, willing to own and yet afraid to strike. So Joseph Addison as a critic is ready, he's ever ready to hurt people with his criticism, but uh, he's, a, he's too afraid to strike first to draw first blood. So he's more like a coward when it, come to, when it comes to criticism. So willing to own, but afraid to strike. So he doesn't have the heart enough to strike. And there's another person, John Hervey. John Hervey is portrayed as Sporus, S-P-O-R-U-S. And this is how Pope ridicules John Hervey, who breaks a butterfly upon a wheel. It seems like a rhetorical question, but the, you know, the criticism is very harsh. See, if you want to kill a butterfly, what do you do? Or what do children do? They just simply tear off, you know, they play with the butterfly and butterflies and at the end of the play, they kill this uh, innocent creature, right? But if you want to hurt a butterfly, you don't need a wheel 
you don't need a cart and you need not you know bind this butterfly and place it under the wheel and just make the wheel run over the butterfly who will do that only um, you know weak critics like john herve will do that so weak people uh, like john herve will break a butterfly upon a wheel because they can't even attain a simple task easily they labor a lot so they do not have enough skill to achieve a simple task so that's the criticism okay. so with this let's go to lake poets of course lake poets we all know uh, poets the famous poets william wordsworth uh, coleridge and so they the romantic poets who lived in lake district and before you know coleridge uh, struck up friendship with wordsworth he was a good friend of robert sadi even they had um you know uh, an ideal project they want to create an ideal society where everyone is equal pantisocracy check out this term pantisocracy so in order to implement that project they went to america they bought some land and they married um sisters i mean uh, one sister called rich and another sister sade but the project didn't come off uh, they didn't have it's not it was not practical so they came back dejected then called rich met uh, wordsworth and his sister dorothy then the friendship then in 1798 we have lyrical ballads okay so a, a manifesto of romanticism a romantic age so what you have to do check out pantisocracy or the friendship between coleridge and sade instead of wordsworth and sade okay and when we think of the friendship between wordsworth and coleridge of course it was good then after the publication of lyrical ballads um, you know they fought and it became bitter and <clears throat> they wrote against each other especially coleridge wrote against wordsworth in uh, literary bi biographia literaria in 1817 okay anyway here is a poem by wordsworth to h c 6 years old h c here refers to hotly coleridge the son of coleridge so uh, wordsworth liked him so much the son of uh, Coleridge, Hotly Coleridge, but like father, Hotly Coleridge became an alcoholic. He died, young. And this is the poem: Oh, blessed vision, happy child, that art so exquisitely wild. I think of thee with many fears, for what may be thy lot in future years. So here is Wordsworth, very concerned about his friend's son, and he's worried. You know, look at this child. Oh, blessed vision, happy child. Look at Hotly Coleridge. you know thou art so exquisitely wild what a creature this is you know hotly called rich but i'm afraid what is in store for you in the future so that's his concern anxiety about um, his well being in the future okay and there is also a famous work by de quincey so de quincey when we say de quincey he is known for his famous work confessions of an english opium eater and is also known for this work reminiscence of the english lake poets in which he talks about each and every poet lake poet wordsworth coleridge and sade uh, we are told that this work irritated wordsworth and wordsworth was offended by de quincey's reminiscence of the english lake poets so sometimes in exams like net competitive exams like that uh we get questions like this who wrote eminis uh, reminiscence of the english poets answer d quincey and also check out in 1798 we got lyrical ballads how many poems were there in lyrical boy poem uh, ballads how many were written by wordsworth how many were written by coleridge take this as an assignment and tell me the answer in the comment section okay let's go for satanic school satanic school you know someone is criticizing someone because the word is negative derogatory so satanic school refers to pb shelley keats and lord byron the term was coined by robert sade yes the lake poet in his work a vision of judgment 
in its preface he said these poets the young romantic poets shelley keats and byron they have deceased hearts and depraved imaginations they they have given themselves to worshiping satan they were not godly their writings were not godly spiritual so robert sade criticized these guys and of course lord byron gave a reply to robert sade uh, robert uh, lord byron wrote the vision of judgment i reply to sade's a vision of judgment just remember a vision of judgment by sade the vision of judgment by lord byron don't get confused and let's check out a work we know this famous elegy pastoral elegy written by shelley on the death of john keats adoni a d o n e i s and in its preface uh, shelley shelley thought that this is the reason keats died he thought the savage criticism on his endymion so when keats endymion was published it was harshly criticized especially there was a review in the journal quarterly review so because of this review in this journal uh, keats was wounded so of course he was wounded but shelley thought this is the prime reason for his death so look at what he says the savage criticism on his endymion which appeared in the quarterly review produced the most violent effect on his susceptible mind the agitation thus originated ended in the rupture of a blood vessel in the lungs a rapid consumption ensued of course we know uh, keats died of tb tuberculosis or consumption the term uh, used those days in those days and look at the reason used by shelley shelley says because of this criticism his lungs was affected and you know uh, then he developed um, tb okay that was his reasoning and shelley said or uh, shelley assumed the review was written by sade because earlier as we looked at before sade called them na shelley keats and byron satanic school in his abhishan of judgment but this work this review was anonymous but shelley thought the anonymous writer was robert sade so, so he attacked robert sade in this work in adone in adone he portrays sade as a nameless worm w o r m a worm here refers to a snake a snake which bit or um, uh, which killed Ad adone here keats so he thought robert sade's criticism harsh criticism was responsible for the death of uh, keats but it, the review was not actually written by sade but by someone else okay anyway before we go to the next um poets group of poets here is a question endymion so endymion was dedicated to a person a poet who was that and what is the first line of this famous work endymion by keats okay next question i mean next one the pre raphaelite brotherhood raphaelite here refers to raphael the renaissance painter italian painter very famous painter and uh, he was known for his simplicity in his painting but you know realistically capturing um, things around him so we have a group of uh, poets and painters young painters in the during the victorian age and they called themselves pre raphaelite brotherhood they imitated the style of raphael and the uh, painters before them before him these are the poets also some of them are painters or philosophers and primarily they are painters t g rossetti dante gabriel rossetti william holman hunt john everest millais james collinson frederick george stephens thomas ulna the most important poet is dg rossetti when we think of the pre raphaelite brotherhood and they are also ran a journal called the germ which could be a possible question and here we have a picture a painting by dg rossetti the daydream 
very beautiful painting. This is also used by, uh, used as a cover by, by William Long. William Long, who is known for his uh, History of English Literature book, a book on History of English Literature. Check out William Long and the cover of his book, History of English Literature. Uh, he used this cover on, in its latest edition. Okay. And before we go to the next one, um, uh, we have a question. Dante Gabriel Rossetti had a sister. Name that sister. And she was known for a famous poem called The Goblin Market. The Goblin Market, G-O-B-L-I-N, The Goblin Market. In that poem, there are two sisters. Who are they? So you have to let me know the name of the sister of D.G. Rossetti. And there are two sisters in the work by that sister, I mean, sister of D.G. Rossetti, the Goblin Market. In Goblin Market, there are two sisters. Name those uh, two sisters. Okay, let's look at a poem by D.G. Rossetti. So D.G. Rossetti wrote a poem called Samuel Taylor Coleridge, in which he calls Coleridge a beacon to our centuries. A beacon in the sense, um, a kind of a lighthouse which guides poets. So he is a guide to our centuries in the sense, centuries of poets. He was the inspiration for others. So that's his uh, tribute to Samuel Taylor Coleridge. His soul fared forth to feed his soul brood hungering in the nest. Okay. So remember this questions like this uh, will definitely come in exams like net. We'll go to the next one. Confessional poets. So confessional poets, we are now going to America, the US, where we have confessional poets who used our their personal issues or they talk about their personal problems in their own books, like confessing their sins in uh, to a priest. So they express themselves, their personal issues and problems to the readers. So very explicit ones. Like, um, I hope you remember the term used by Keats regarding Wordsworth, egotistical sublime, right? So I, uh, or listen to the lecture on literary criticism, yesterday's lecture, where we talked about Keats' two term, negative capability and egotistical sublime. Confessional poem comes to the second category, in the second category, egotistical sublime. They express that ego. Let's see. So we got po poets like John Berryman, Robert Lowell. Then when we say confessional poet, we think of this poet, Sylvia Plot. Then uh, we have, of course, we have Anne Sexton. Then we have Theodore Red Hook. Uh, uh, this um, pronunciation is a bit tough. R O E T H K E. So the first part we say red, then K K U H like that. Red, uh, Reduck. So Reduck, a tough pronunciation. Okay, last one. William D. Witt Snodgrass. And under Robert Lowell, we had uh, two students, Sylvia Plot and Anne Sexton. So uh, Sylvia Plot and Anne Sexton were students of Robert Lowell. And we should also think of, whenever we read about poets, we should also uh, get to know about some of their works. So Robert Lowell, we have Life Studies, a collection, of, a poetry collection. Similar way, we have to get to know uh, works by Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plot and others. So these poets, the 1950s and 60s American poets were called confessional poets. We can also think of uh, Kamala Das, the Indian poet Kamala Das, because uh, she is also a confessional poet, because she talks about her personal uh, problems. Because here the personal is political, because it's not just about Kamala Das and her uh, personal problems. It's also about problems faced by women in general. So whenever we think of confessional poets, we can think of this um, uh, feminist idea that the personal is political. Also check out who wrote an essay called The Personal is Political. Okay, let's look at a poem by Sylvia Plot. We have Lady Lazarus. So Lady Lazarus where um, 
kind of a resurrection how a lady resurrects herself after death lady lazarus and silvia plot is the lady lazarus here she attempts suicide there are many suicide attempts and she it's a kind of a confession a kind of a suicide letter this poem is like a suicide letter because um, after some time later uh, later the publication of this work she committed suicide she gassed herself to death and i a smiling woman i am only 30 and like the cat i have nine times to die this is number 3 what a trash to annihilate each decade so living is like a burden for silvia plot here you know because of her uh, mental health and she feels like um, uh, sisyphus going up to the mountain and coming back and uh, doing the routine again and again so like a cat i have nine times to die so this is her third attempt to die so this is a uh, confessional poetry so you can the mood or the mode is more like confessional confessing everything to the readers and when we think of silvia plot think of her uh, poetry collection ariel and look at the cover uh, for, forward by robert lovell we can understand the relationship between the teacher robert lovell and the student silvia plot next we have harlem renaissance one of the significant poetry moments uh, we should be knowing harlem renaissance for the first time we have black poets have their own movements they are asserting their own color and tradition new negro movements or uh, it's also called new negro movement harlem renaissance we have poets like county cullen w e b du bois d u b o i s du bois langston hughes or claude mckay jean tumer j e a n jean tumer zora neil hurston and we have an anthology called the new negro voices of the harlem renaissance that's a subtitle it was edited by alan lock a l a i n lock l o c k e sometimes we can get questions like uh, which anthology is produced by this group or which anthology is related to a particular school of poetry so remember this when you think of harlem renaissance think of the new negro voices of the harlem renaissance an anthology of work works by edited by alan lock and let's look at a poem one of the famous harlem renaissance writer so we have langston hughes name of the poem harlem harlem is the name of the place in america where you got a lot of black poets asserting their rights a lot of artists not just poets they asserted their black identity and also claimed their african tradition so these are or the they celebrated their african heritage so look at the poem some of the lines in the poem what happens to a dream deferred so just imagine you have a dream someone gives you hopes and you build dreams based on that hopes or those hopes and if that is not fulfilled if that person forget that dream or the hopes given to you so what happens to them does it dry up like a raisin in the sun like uh, you know like grapes they just uh, you know uh, develop wrinkles on its skin and uh, get exposed to the sun and like a raisin in the sun they dry up or fester like a sore just to think of your wound it develops a layer right after a period of time the wound the raw wound develops a layer on on that surface that is called fester and then run it's a question does it stink like a rotten meat so the dreams they are not realized they are like rotten meat they smell it is there in us throughout our life so somewhere we have to tolerate the smell and more so we have all these are questions rhetorical question the answers are not given okay and beautiful thing about this poem we have this famous phrase a raisin in the sun it is used as a title by by, by lorraine hansbury for her play a raisin in the sun a beautiful work you should read this uh, play 
a raisin in the sun. Why? Because here is a family, a black family living in a neighborhood known for blacks. But now they have some money. They try to move to a new neighborhood. But that neighborhood is known for, <clears throat> it's a white neighborhood. Thinking, think of the situation, a black family moving to a white neighborhood. There were protests. There were people who were against the moving of this black family to the white neighborhood. What happens? Will this family you know, stick up to that decision or will they yield and surrender and they uh, will not move to that new location? So read a raisin in the sun. Okay. Imagism. When we think of uh, poetry movements, there are a lot of movements like a symbolism, imagism. So you can check out symbolism. When we say symbolism, we think of Edgar Allan Poe and French writers. So if we, here we have got imagism. What do you mean by imagism? So when we write poems, we should use images, concrete images to convey abstract ideas. And this method is called idio Grammic method, I D E O G R A M M I C. Ideogrammic method, in the sense, in your works, in your work, you have to use concrete images to convey abstract ideas like love, God, any feeling. So, how can someone understand what you convey? You know, what feeling you convey? In order to do that, you have to use images. So, that images can convey those abstract ideas. So this was a put forward by Ezra Pound. I hope Ezra Pound, you remember Ezra Pound? Ezra Pound was a very famous uh, modernist poet. When you think of Ezra Pound, also think of T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot and his famous work, Wasteland. Because the Wasteland was edited by Ezra Pound and later the Wasteland was dedicated to Ezra Pound by T.S. Eliot. And name the year in which T.S. Eliot, the Wasteland was published. Very significant year when it comes to modernism. Okay, when we say images to poet, these are the famous poets. We have William Carlos Williams, then Richard Aldington, then H.T. Hilda Doolittle, uh, Do Amy Lowell, Ford Maddox Fodder. So they also have an anthology edited by Ezra Pong. Name of the anthology, The Images. French, D-E-S, -E images, I-M-A-G-I-S-T-E-S, -E the images, that's all. So we have, on the cover, we also have another uh, images poet, F.S. Flint. Uh, you might be aware that to this, to this anthology, there is also another anthology, um, James Joyce contributed and also D.H. Lawrence. So even James Joyce and D.H. Lawrence can be called images poets. And when we think of images poets, of course, we think of Ezra Pound and his famous work, In a Station of the Metro. So Ezra Pound said, you have to use concrete images to convey abstract ideas. Look at this poem. In a Station of the Metro, just two, line, just two lines. The apparition of these faces in the crowd. We have semicolon. Petals on a bed black bow. That's all. Just two lines, just a metaphor. It's like a, a metaphysical conceit. We can think of John Donne, that kind of a comparison, far-fetched comparison. So think of a metro station, people waiting in the peak hour, or they are in the shade now. What do you see? You just crane your neck. What do you see? Just heads here and there. Just a crowd of heads, not just people, just heads here and there. It's like ghosts. You just look at the heads. The apparition, apparition here refers to ghosts. The apparition of these faces in the crowd. Because we don't see them as individuals, just faces. The apparition of these faces in the crowd. So this is a description, an image. Think of a platform, a railway station, and you have a platform. On the platform, in the peak cover, we have, we have countless people in the shade. We just see only their faces. So that's the one image. Next one is a comparison. So when you think of this one, a flat form of people, we think of a branch. So petals on a 
wet black bow so think of a tree after rain so after rain we we think of a tree and its branch so we think of a wet black branch on the branch we have lot of petals and we have lot of rain drops and which are countless so we have a wet black branch dotted with uh, rain drops this is a comparison on on the other hand we have a flat form full of people dotted with people and we just look at their faces that's all just two images concrete images and this is called image ezra pound defines image as you know something that provokes thoughts you know complex intellectual and emotional complex in an instant of time just snap of finger you should be able to visualize these things and intellectual and emotional complex it should provoke that in your mind in an instant of time so that's the definition for image by ezra pound and also check out let me know the famous poem by william corliss williams one of the famous uh images poets what's what's his famous images to poem it's about a wheel barrow so let me know the full title of that poem okay so with this uh, let's end today's class and today we looked at some of the famous literary uh, moments associated with poetry tomorrow we will go for drama and the day after tomorrow the last class we'll go for fiction and please subscribe to professor academy's new channel professor academy english a channel exclusively for the students of english literature and we offer courses for ugc net and set in tamil nadu we offer courses for ugtrb pgtrb polytechnic trb and tet thank you